together. Joshua chapter one, we'll read a few verses and we'll also spend a couple moments in Joshua chapter three. Let's jump in. Joshua 101, after the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I'm giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Here's the promise. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have already given you. Which just means you can't step on anything I can't give to you. You can't get into anything I can't bring you through. You can't walk on anything I won't deliver to you. Verse 2 stood out to me as I was preparing for our time together. He said, Moses is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you. The time has come. Joshua, the time has come for you. Come on, help me with my title today. Look at your neighbor and tell him, it's my time. It's my time. Y'all didn't do that very good. Look at the other neighbor who really believes that God might do something for you this year and tell him, it's my time. It's my time. Come on, let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that even though there have been wildernesses in our experience, even though for some of us the last season was a season of loss, the losses became lessons and they have prepared us for such a time as this. We believe that you are with us in the desert and that you will be with us now as we step into your promise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I, I want to share with you three parts of this process of crossing over. And as we cross into the new year, uh, I understand that on some level, it's just the passing of time. There's nothing inherently different from a spiritual level uh, from December 31st to January 1st, from one month to the next month. I understand that. And yet at the same time, uh, as we mark the passing of time and the passing of seasons, I do think that there are opportunities um, for us to recognize the way God works within times and seasons and the way God brings us out of certain seasons and into others. Uh, I want to share with you three parts of what I feel like God was doing for the people of Israel as he was bringing them out of the desert and into the promised land. And they are the same things I think God is trying to do with us and that some of us need God to do as we step into a new year. Uh, in verse two, as we have just read together, God declares to Joshua, it's your time. The time has come for you to lead these people. But before he declares to Joshua, it's your time, he begins by declaring this, Moses, my servant is dead. If you're writing down notes, just write down the words, my past. It's, it's, it's my time. What time is it? it? It's time for my past to be processed. See, I found that a lot of us have unprocessed pasts. We have, we have uh, things in our past that haven't been fully healed, that haven't been fully dealt with, that haven't been fully addressed. And that some of us are trying to step into a new season while carrying old hurts, unforgiveness, bitterness, woundedness, regret, grief. It's impossible to step into a new place and a new land and to fully possess it, walk in it, and experience it for all that it is if you are carrying your past with you. Before, uh, before Joshua could lead and move and walk in, God tells him Moses is dead. Now, what is interesting is that if we flip uh, your Bibles, if you have a physical Bible, if you don't know, they actually print them out on paper. Um, they still do that. And if you have one of those, you can flip the, you know, and for the rest of you, you can maybe just swipe or just hit the little back button on, on your Bible. And, um, and you can go to the previous chapter, which is in the, the previous book of Deuteronomy. It's Deuteronomy chapter 34, the last chapter of Deuteronomy before we cross over into Joshua. And in the last chapter of Deuteronomy, Moses dies. Moses dies and the people of Israel, the Bible says, once they realize that he's dead, they mourn for 30 days. 
And now, as we move into the book of Joshua, uh, Moses, or Joshua rather, is getting ready to, uh, to, to lead the people into uh, the promised land. And God, before he tells them, hey, it's your time, he reminds Moses of a fact that, or, or Joshua rather, of a fact that Joshua uh, must have been fully aware of, that Moses is dead. We just been at a 30 day funeral. Y'all ever going to a long funeral? Come on, funerals are different. You know, it's different contextually. It's different sometimes geographically. It's different culturally, you know, depending on your background. You know, some, fun some funerals, they'll be like 30 minutes in and we're just like, we're done. They dead, we just like, they, they gone. There's other funerals, bro, they're going to be, you know, it's going to be like a five hour affair. People going to be climbing in the casket. Come on, you ain't been to a good funeral until they fall out and they have to get the smelling salts and wake them up. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And, um, and, and so they just had a 30 year, a 30 day funeral for Moses. Everybody knows Moses is dead. And yet before Joshua moves forward, God has to reiterate to Joshua that Moses is indeed dead. When Moses died, um, see, part of the challenge of letting go uh, of, of whatever is in your past, part of the, the challenge of, of fully processing your past is that some of us uh, weren't ready to uh, let go of what we had to let go of. Some of us didn't anticipate um, the thing that died in our lives. We didn't anticipate it dying. Sometimes you can anticipate uh, about, about this time last year, um, our dog Moses died and we knew it was coming. I mean, he was, he, we knew it was his last days. In fact, if, uh, if he hadn't had died when he died, the night that he died, the next day, um, I was going to, well, there was a debate whether or not we were going to take him to the vet. I didn't grow up with a vet. I grew up like, I grew up on the farm. And then when it was time for an animal to be put down, we put him down. And so I told my wife, I ain't no need to spend $125 for the vet. I'll take him out in the back. We live in a, in a, like a community, you know what I'm saying? But there's some woods behind our house. And I said, I can take care. And my wife was like, you can't do that to Moses. I said, $125. That, that, that shell will cost me about 50 cents. Do the math. Anyway, um, I feel like Moses knew what was up. And like we knew it and, and the next morning he was gone and he passed away in his sleep and we knew it was coming. But sometimes, you ever, you ever lose something you, you just didn't expect to lose when you lost it? A relationship that you didn't know was over and then all of a sudden it's over and I didn't even know. We... The people that you thought were, you know, it was all good. I, I, I've had people tell me they were leaving the church and I was like, I didn't even, like, I feel like you just served me divorce papers and I didn't even know we were fighting. I thought we, was, we were good. This is the first conversation we've had and all of a sudden, like, I'm, you know, you ever, you ever, the Bible says that Moses in chapter 34, that Moses, the last time Israel sees Moses, he's climbing a mountain to go meet with God, which is what he did oftentimes. And, and at the top of the mountain, he meets with God. When he's climbing, though, the Bible says that Moses, though 120 years old, his, his strength was not diminished. His natural vigor was, was not, uh, was not lessened in any way. He, he still had clear eyes and strong legs. He wasn't on a walker, on a cane, getting up the mountain. He was climbing that thing. He was running up that mountain. He looked strong. He looked like he could lead them for another 40 years. And yet he doesn't come back. In fact, they wait at the bottom of the mountain and the Bible never says that anybody even tells them that he's dead. He didn't look like he was going to die. There was no indications that this was our last experience with Moses. And here they are at the bottom of the mountain waiting for Moses to come back because he always went up to the mountain to, to be with God and he would always come back. And now they're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting. And now they have to make a decision to move on even though they have incomplete information. I found that some of us are still waiting for things to come back that are never coming back. You're waiting for people to come back. You're waiting for opportunities to come back. You're waiting for seasons to come back. And you think if I just wait longer here and at some point the people who were at the bottom of the mountain had to realize, I don't know who the first one was who said it. I don't know if they started whispering it. I don't know who came to the conclusion, but somebody had to realize, guys, I don't think he's coming back. 
What do you mean he's not coming back? He always comes back. I don't think this time he's coming back. Y'all, I think Moses died. Moses dies on the mountain, and the Bible says something interesting. It says, and he buried him there. Who buried him there? Moses went up by himself. The only other person there was the one who buried him there. God buried Moses there. Why would God bury Moses? In fact, the Bible says God buried him there, and no one knows where he was buried to this day. How do we know that nobody knows where he was buried? Because they must have gone looking. Because God knew that they would do what we do when something leaves our lives that we felt like we absolutely needed and couldn't leave with, live without, we went to dig it back up. And some of us are trying to step into a new season and step into a new year and walk into 2024 dragging the corpse of something. Digging up old bo bodies, old bones, carrying skeletons into our new season because I don't think I can move into my future without this thing from my past. See, Moses wasn't just a man. Moses was the man. For these people, every one of these people, except for Joshua and Caleb, all of them had been born in the wilderness, which means they have never known anything other than Moses and his leadership. They have never experienced a season in their life when Moses wasn't the man. He was their deliverer. He was their lawgiver. He was their judge and their mediator. He was all of these things. And now Moses is gone and they cannot imagine a future without this person. They cannot even begin to imagine stepping into the promises of God. They just knew this was the way God was going to bring him into the promised land. He brought him out of Egypt. He led him through the wilderness. He's going to lead us into the promised land. And now all of a sudden Moses is gone. They're waiting on him and he's not coming back. And they have to learn how to grieve and go on. It's not wrong to grieve. Some of us are dealing with things that have died in our past, things that maybe not people, maybe people, maybe people, maybe, maybe opportunities, maybe expectations and hopes, but we're dealing with things that we thought were going to be one way and now we realize it's not going to be the way we thought it would be and that produces grief. That's understandable. It is right to grieve. God gives the people a season of grief because grief is natural and grief is necessary. It's okay to come to the end of a season and shed tears. It's okay, it's okay to take a season and 30 days and then grieved and mourned. And at the end of the season of grieving, God speaks to Joshua and says, now it's your time to lead these people and go into the promise. It's okay to grieve, but don't, listen, don't let your grief keep, keep you from your growth. I'll say it again. Don't let your grief keep you from your growth. It's okay to grieve. But sometimes we get caught in a cycle of re-grieving. Our word, our English word regret comes from a French root, which literally means to re-grieve. It's okay to grieve. But some of us are re-grieving, 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 digging up old hurts, digging up old experience, dragging them along with us. And at some point you have to let God bury it. If I'm going to move forward, I'm going to have to put it in God's hands and let him bury it. And I'm going to have to learn how to grieve and go on. Come on, what is it from your past that needs to be buried? What, 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 what hurt needs to be forgiven? What pain needs to be healed? As we move now, Joshua chapter one, God speaks to him and says, now it's your time. Moses is dead. I know Moses is dead. We just got done with the funeral, the 30 day funeral. And, and God said, yeah, but I just want to, I want to reiterate the fact that, that the thing that, that you, maybe even while y'all were grieving, y'all were secretly hoping, maybe God would do a miracle. Listen, it's over. And now is your time. God speaks to Joshua again in Joshua chapter three. Early in the morning, the Bible says, Joshua and the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they came before crossing over. And God gives instructions to give to Israel. And, and in chapter five, in verse five, we read part of the instruction. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. If you're writing down notes, this is the second part. It's my purity. Come on, it's my time. My time for what? It's my time. It's time for my past to be processed. It's okay to grieve what's been lost, but I can't stay here any longer. I can't be defined by what was. Because God, listen, God did not tie your future to someone who left you. 
God did not tie your destiny to something that you don't have anymore. Ultimately, your destiny isn't tied to anything or any purpose person other than the Lord himself. But I just can't imagine doing this without them. I can't imagine achieving this without this part of my life. But if you don't have it, if you don't have it, it must mean you don't need it. Because God would never call you to do something without giving you everything you need to do it. So if he called you to step into the promise and you don't have it, then you must not need it to do what God called you to do. My past, number two, my purity, it's time. Time for what? It's time for my purity to be my priority. Joshua says, hey, consecrate yourselves. He's talking to a group of people who have been living in the wilderness as a result, there are certain lifestyles, certain habits, certain behaviors that they have adopted or ones that they have not adopted that the word of God prescribed. In fact, a couple chapters later in Joshua chapter five, we would see this call to consecration get lived out in a very literal way. In Joshua chapter five, as soon as the people cross into the promised land, the first thing God calls them to do is to Remember and reenact the ceremony of circumcision. Now, that, that's physical, a physical thing, but it has spiritual implications. The spiritual implications were that circumcision was the mark of God's covenant, and it was a way of, of, of literally dealing with the flesh. In the New Testament, circumcision becomes symbolic of the work of sanctification, whereby God identifies us as his people, crucifies our flesh so that we might live in the spirit. When, when, the, when this happened at a place called Gilgal in, in Joshua chapter five, God declared this. He said, today I have rolled the reproach of Egypt from off of you. It's an interesting statement. It's interesting because none of the people who were circumcised, the reason they were circumcised in Gilgal is because they had been born in the wilderness and so they had not been circumcised in the wilderness. This, this act, this rite, ritual of circumcision had not been practiced during the, during the wilderness 40 years. So none of these people who were being circumcised in Joshua chapter 5, none of them had ever been in Egypt. They didn't know about Egypt. They had never set foot in Egypt. And yet God said, today I have rolled the reproach of Egypt off of you. What are you talking about? What does this mean? Can I tell you that what it means is it is possible for you to get out of Egypt and Egypt not be out of you. I say you can get out of Egypt and not have Egypt out of you. In fact, salvation, if you will, is us getting out of Egypt. But sanctification is Egypt getting out of us. Even though they had never stepped foot in Egypt, they still had the mindset of Egyptians. They still thought like Egyptians and spoke like Egyptians and they still wanted the same things the Egyptians wanted. In fact, over and over in the wilderness, we see the people of God longing to go back to Egypt. I'm out of Egypt, but Egypt is still in me. And on that day, God said, today I have, I have taken Egypt, its reproach and shame off of you and out of you. Y'all remember when God raised Lazarus from the dead, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead? Lazarus comes out with a word. Lazarus come forth. Lazarus comes out, but the Bible says he was still bound in the grave clothes. Again, it's possible to get out of the grave, but still have the grave on you. It's possible to come out of the lifestyle that you were in, out of the sin you were in, and still have it on you. Jesus then speaks to the people around him and says, loose him and let him go. I'm talking about the need for purity. And, and I, I love this because he says this, um, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. Sanctify yourselves. Why? Because something's going to happen. What's going to happen? God is going to do amazing things among you. The, the motivation for our consecration is the promise of God's work in our lives. You know, you know why, we, why we consecrate ourselves? You know why we do 21 days of prayer and fasting at the beginning of the year? Because we believe God is going to do amazing things among us this year. 
And it is that hope that motivates us. We want to be ready for what God is doing. Purity prepares us for whatever God is going to do in our lives. I love what the, uh, what the Bible says in, in Proverbs 29, 18. It says, where there is no prophetic vision, that is where there is no expectation of what is coming, people cast off restraint. When you don't have a vision for the future, when you don't have expectation, when you don't believe God is going to do something amazing, you just let anything go. 1 John 3 and 30 says it like this. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. When you have, when you have hope that God is, it has prepared something great for you, you want to be ready for it. You don't want God to open the door and you not be ready to walk through it. Come on. When, 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 when you know, when you know he's going to take you out to the nice restaurant, he ain't just a waffle house tonight. You know, maybe, maybe there's going to be a ring involved. Maybe there's whatever. Can I just tell you, you're going to get ready differently. Yeah. I don't need a shower. I showered yesterday. No, 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 no. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let get the deep clean. You know, uh, you're gonna get. It's all gotta be right. Why? Because I'm expecting something, and so I purify. My, whoever has this hope purifies themselves. Hope leads to holiness. I know it's old school, but I still believe holiness is right. I still believe there ought to be something different about the people of God. I still believe, listen, God didn't just call us out of the grave, but God wants to, God wants our lives to look different. Purity prepares us. This is a season, 21 days of prayer and fasting is a season of consecration that we are preparing for God. I don't know what you're going to do and I don't know when you're going to do it or how you're going to do it, but I believe you're going to do great things this year and I want to be ready. When God calls Lazarus out of the grave, Lazarus comes out and then God commands Lazarus to be sanctified, to be freed, to be loosened from what had him bound. He calls him out of the grave and the only person involved with that was Jesus. Jesus spoke and Lazarus answered. But when it came to his freedom, his release from bondage, his sanctification, if you will, that involved community. Jesus actually doesn't speak to Lazarus about his sanctification. He speaks to the people around Lazarus and says to them, loose him and let him go. I'm telling you, some of you, some of you are trying to get free from some stuff and you can never get free because you're trying to do it on your own. And, and holiness and sanctification and consecration happens in community. You need some people around you to help you. I don't need that small group. I'm, fi- I'm just fine, preacher. I'm coming into 2024. This is my year. Your year for what? You're tied up with everything. Like you're still bound by the same thing you've been bound by. I don't know why I can't get free from this. Listen, because you're fighting a battle you cannot win by yourself. You got to have some people around you who love you enough to be willing to get close enough to you to smell what is on you and where you used to be. Love you enough to pull a, a thread, to pull a piece and say, listen, you're better than this. God has more for you than this. I'm just telling you, some of you need to jump in a small group. You need to get in a freedom group. You need to get around some people who will love you enough to help you get better. Why? Because tomorrow, God's coming. Tomorrow, the Lord's going to do something wonderful because there's an expectation. I'm telling you, this is, a, this is an amazing season to, to dive in, to consecrate yourselves to seek God's face, to, to, to pray for the purifying grace of God. God, anything in me that, that isn't right and isn't ready for what you have for me? And then finally, the Bible says, after three days, the officers went through the camp and they gave orders to the people. Now, these are the marching orders. This is what's going to happen after they have consecrated themselves. It says, when you see the Ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. And then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. For writing down notes, this is the last one. Just write down my pursuit. It's time. What time is it? It's time for my pursuit to be 
his presence. When you see the ark move, go after it. The ark of the covenant, the Old Testament, represented the manifestation of the presence of God. And he says, when the presence of God moves, you go after it. Why? Because you don't know which way to go. You've never been this way before. You were born in the desert. You've lived your whole life in the desert. You've never, you've never crossed Jordan before. You've never crossed this river before, so you don't know how to do it. Anybody, anybody ever play Oregon Trail? Oregon Trail, anybody? You old, 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 I'm old. Come on. And all you young people that don't know what I'm talking about, I feel so bad for you. I feel so sorry for you. I don't know what games y'all playing today, but they, I, I know this. They are not nearly as life-changing as Oregon Trail. You didn't know 16-bit graphics could hit that hard. You didn't know, you didn't know something on a, on a floppy disk, four floppy disks to be exact, could make that kind of impact on your life. But the Oregon Trail, the Oregon Trail taught us about life, about real life. Not about, not about easy life. The Oregon Trail, you, I played Oregon Trail a hundred times. I probably got to Oregon twice, maybe. And only if I started as a banker from Boston and had plenty of money. Emma, Emma Sue would die of dysentery. Come on. Your wife, Susie Beth, would get smallpox and just die. You have no food. You have to go out and hunt for it. And then nothing but squirrels would come out. No buffalo, no deer, just squirrels. Waste all your ammunition trying to shoot a two-pound squirrel. It'll feed you for one day. I'm talking about real life. You know, and sometimes you come to, so you come to a river when you're on the Oregon Trail. Y'all know what I'm talking about, but I'm going to educate you. I'm going to educate some of young people today. You come to this river, and you have to cross the river. And you had options about how you would try to cross the river. Y'all, anybody? So one of the options was you just ford the river. Ford, you just forge right through it. You just plow right through it. Just keep going. You just tell your oxen, I know I see the water. By faith, I believe that water is six inches deep and we can just roll right through it. And maybe it is because you don't know, you don't know this river. This is new territory. And so you, you know, you, you send the oxen on and sometimes they walk right through it. Woo! Sometimes, most of the time, instead you would see that mm, 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 covered over, everybody dies. <laughs> Option number two caulk the wagon and float across. Okay, so this just means we are going to turn our, our you know, land vehicle into a sea vehicle. Like we got this amphibious, like this is like 1812 for real. And all of a sudden, and so you, you caulk it up, right? And you send it across and all of a sudden there it goes, bloop, 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 and then everybody dies. Now the third option was always the best option. You could pay for help. You could, you, could, you could pay or barter with natives who knew the land and they would help you get across. It was the only way where you were essentially guaranteed to get across, but you could only do it if you had money. If you had money and you could, you would ask the natives for help. You would, you would, you would barter with the natives and have them help you. Why? Because they knew the terrain and they would lead you down the right path. Can I tell you? Listen to me. I have no idea what this year holds. Neither do you. You have never been this way before. But I've done a year before. I've done a lot of years before. I've lived, you know, I'm, I'm 30 years old. I'm 40 years old. I'm 50 years old. I'm 15 years old. I'm whatever. You've never been this way before. Ever. And maybe you think you can look at the river and be like, yeah. We can just cross, we can just, just keep going. That you can navigate this year on your own ingenuity. But I'm telling you, the only way I know how to navigate terrain I've never been through is to follow the one who's already been there. The one who knows every turn of the river, who knows every rocky patch, the one who knows who's already in my 2024, who's already in my tomorrow and is leading me through it. Can I just tell you, church, we need to be led by the Holy Spirit now more than ever. 
We need to follow the presence of God and the word of God and the power of God now more than ever that, that, that I'm not walking in my own strength and my own wisdom, but in the wisdom of the world and, and the word. And can I tell you, this is why we pray. This is why 21 days, because we've never been this way before. I don't know what this year will bring. I promise you, it's going to bring some good stuff. And I promise you, it's going to bring some pain. You're going to laugh this year. You're going to weep this year. For some of us, in ways we couldn't have expected. And so when it does, we better be able to follow him. I don't want to wait until 2024 does what it's going to do because it's going to do what it's going to do. I don't know what it's going to do, but it's going to do it. And I don't want to wait until it does what it's going to do and then all of a sudden try to find my footing. Then all of a sudden, when the water is flowing over my wagon, be like, hey, natives, could use some help too late, bruh. That's why for us, Listen, prayer is not a last resort, it is our first response. We're gonna pray first. I, I can't invite you hard enough to say, come be a part of 21 days. We're gonna follow the presence of God. When the ark moves, we move. If God says left, we're gonna go left. If he says right, we're gonna go right. We, we, are, we know enough to know we don't know enough. Let us have enough wisdom to understand that we don't have enough wisdom to understand what's going to happen this year or how we're going to navigate it. And so we are going to submit our ways to the Lord. We don't trust in our own understanding, but in all of our ways, we acknowledge Him. We got to process our past. We have to prepare ourselves in the present. And we have to pursue God's presence into our future. And you know that God gives us a gift that empowers us to do all three of those things. Prayer. Prayer is how we process our past. Prayer is how we purify ourselves and prepare for what God has for us. And prayer is how we pursue his presence and his purpose for our lives. I can't tell you how many times in prayer, God has pointed something in my heart, some, some unforgiveness. I thought, I thought I'd, I was over. I thought it was done. And, and, then, and then all of a sudden, God will point it out. Resentment, unhealed hurts. I can't tell you how many times God has pointed out mindsets, attitudes, language, treatment of others that was unholy did not reflect who he is, reflected where I'd been and what I'd come through, but not who I was and where I was going. And God said, you got to let that go. I got to, I got to get that off of you. I can't tell you how many times in prayer God has, when I thought we were going to just keep rolling for the river that God said, no, 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 go left. No, go. There's a wisdom that comes from the presence of God. There's a wisdom that comes from seeking the face of God when you don't know which way to go. The Bible says that the the spirit, that we don't even know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit will pray and intercede for us and through us. I love it. My pastor says as we we close today, my pastor says this. He says, prayer is the difference between the best you can do and the best God can do. And this year, I don't just want the best I can do. I've had the best I can do. It wasn't that good. I want God's best for my life. Anybody else? So come on, this year we're gonna pray first. We're gonna seek God. We're gonna go after the presence of God. We're not pursuing the provisions of God. We're we're pursuing the presence of God. But the good news is when you pursue the presence, come on, you walk into the promise. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack anything. Surely goodness and mercy follow me while I follow him. I'm telling you, if you will make the presence of God, if you'll make God your aim this year, if you'll seek after him with all of your heart, I can't promise you that this year will bring you only good things. But I can promise you that no matter what it brings, he will bring you through it. 
greater is he who's in you. And even if you have to walk through the darkest valley, you don't have to be afraid of anything because he is with you. Come on, before we get out of here, let's pray today. Let's pray together. If you're here today, listen to me. And we all come through hardships and disappointments. And for some of us, Moses is dead. Maybe you just realized it. The marriage is dead. The business is dead. The plans I made are dead. The thing that I thought was going to take me to where I wanted to go is not going to take me there. On the other side of Moses' death is the arrival, the revelation of Joshua. Yeshua, which is the Hebrew name that is given to the Messiah, Jesus. His Hebrew name is Yeshua, Joshua. I found that on the other side of my grief, on the other side of the thing that I didn't think I could live without, on the other side of losing something that I thought was absolutely necessary, that is often where I find the thing that only is necessary. Jesus. Joshua literally means Yahweh saves, the Lord saves. If you're here today and you have come to the realization that something you had put your faith in is not going to take you all the way as far as you thought it would, I take no delight in that. But I can tell you, you're not alone. All of us, listen, every person, everything that you put your faith in, in this life, besides God himself, at some point will disappoint you. But I want to invite you on the other side of that. I want you to invi invite you to receive God's answer to every disappointment. Yeshua, Joshua, Jesus. If you're here today, you say, Tim, I know I need to get right with God. I'm stepping in this new year and I want to do it differently. Come on, maybe you need to come back to God again. If that's you, pray this in your heart while I pray it out loud right now across all of our locations. Come on, pray it with me. Father, right now, thank you. Thank you that when everything else failed me, you never did. Thank you, Jesus, that you are always there and that the battle has already been fought and it's already been won. And whether or not I receive the goodness of God and the favor and the grace of God is not up to me because you already did it. All I have to do is receive Jesus and with him every good thing that the Father offers. So today we do that. We can grieve Moses, but we receive Jesus. We can grieve what we've lost, but we celebrate today what we have found. We have found a pearl of great price. We have found the answer to every one of our questions, the fulfillment of every desire in Jesus. We receive you right now. God saves. Save us now, Lord. Save us from putting our faith in things that can never fulfill. Today, we put our faith in you alone. And for those of us, God, who are already believers and we're walking in Jesus and following Jesus, today, God, we consecrate ourselves afresh. As we begin 21 days of prayer and fasting as a church body, as a, as a family of faith, today, God, we, we commit ourselves to praying first, to seeking you with all of our heart and to letting you guide us into this new season. In Jesus' name.